the most complicated joint in the human body. This is a 10 day course at a lot of institutions that are really good at this stuff. And I'm gonna try and give you a really, really simple framework to look at the neck and shoulders today so that you understand what, what your anatomy is made up of, what, what your joints are supposed to do, what can go wrong, and how to fix them. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a lot about the practical implications of that and, and uh, identification of issues in the clinic. But <clears throat> I got, you all have a guide in front of you. Um, this is not. Um, this is an integration of medical, uh, medical terminology and practical corrective exercise. So I'm not trying to take the place of a doctor of physical therapy or any um, uh, any uh, medical personnel. What I'm trying to do is take the literature and make it practical, use and useful for you in your everyday life and in your gym life. So um, let's begin with that. Uh, I am a strength and conditioning coach. And I have been working in the industry for about 14 years. Uh, Brett and I were talking last night. I'm not, I don't have a formal degree in exercise science or anything like that. I, I am uh, certified through private institutions. I, I still study the work of nutritionists, kinesiologists, and other uh, movement scientists. And I take what they are doing and discovering and working really well and just implement it. So I've been doing that for a long time. I like to keep it simple and um, learn from the people who are the best at what they do, so that I can do the best of what or I can be the best at what I do, which is teach. So the definitions um, we're talking about. Uh, where's my? Oh, good, excellent. Uh, we're going to talk about the three most common injuries of the neck and shoulder, and they're the neck, the musculature of the neck and shoulder are the same. That's why we've lumped them together for the purpose of this uh, clinic. Um, and we're going to talk about the qualities of joint mechanics, mobility, stability, strength, and power. And these are practical definitions. This is not, this is not again, a medical textbook definition. So this is our inside of Training for Warriors. Here's what we mean when we say so that we can all use, have the same language. Um, the, uh, uh, let's talk about anatomy first because that's really going to be kind of where we all can come together. Um, Lucy's got a tank top, so she's going to be my anatomical example here. <clears throat> Your body is made up of joints and, and muscles. And uh, there's, a, there's a theory of joint mechanics called alternating joint theory. And that states that um, every joint is um, preceded and, and um, followed by joints that have opposite functions. Um, so if you think about just the body from the ground up, you have a highly mobile ankle. It can go in you know, many, many degrees of motion, many different planes of motion. And then you have a very stable knee. It only goes in one direction. You have a highly mobile hip. And then you have, which you know, goes in almost any direction, and you have a very stable sacroiliac joint. So it actually doesn't move at all. It's hardly a joint. Uh, and above that, you have the lumbar spine, which is much more mobile, moves in um, all three planes of motions. You have a thoracic spine that is actually pretty mobile too, so it kind of breaks the rules there. But the, the theory is more or less true that above or upstream and downstream, the joints alternate in function uh, pretty specifically. How that relates to the, the, the neck and shoulder is there's four, there's four joints in the neck and shoulder complex. The glenohumeral joint, highly mobile, so ball and socket joint can move in, in almost any direction. You have where the shoulder blade meets the, the rib cage, this is called the scapula thoracic joint. This joint's very stable. The scapula only moves a few degrees. It moves in quite a few different movement planes, but it adds stability to a joint complex that's highly mobile. The thoracic spine and the uh, the ball and socket humerus, or the ball and socket blending humerus. So you have one, two, and then you have the stable, you got a stable scapula thoracic joint, but I see. And then you have a, a highly mobile thoracic spine. The thoracic spine is composed of a bunch of vertebrae, and you can see, go ahead and tuck your chin to your chest. The C7 is the beginning, C7 T1 is the top of the thoracic spine. And those vertebrae are quite thick. The vertebrae are quite thick, and they go down to the lumbar spines. So you've got about you have twelve of them, um, 
and they, each of them can move about eight degrees front to back, and each of them can rotate 15 degrees or so, because they have uh, quite a bit of play in them. So go ahead and stand and look straight ahead. So you have each of these individual vertebrae have quite a bit of mobility in between each of them, and they add up to a lot of mobility um, in the, the, the thoracic spine. And then, um, what's, I said three joints, thoracic, thoracic, scap, scap, thoracic, living humeral, and then the, um, the AC joint, which is where the clavicle meets the, the chromium process. So that's, those are the four big joints in the shoulder and neck complex that we're going to be talking about today, and those are the, the areas where people have the most problems. So, ball and socket, AC joint, scapula thoracic, go ahead and roll that shoulder, yeah, roll the shoulder around, scapula thoracic, and then T-spine, which is what allows you to rotate, look up, look down, and move in anywhere above your waist, essentially. Yeah, see glazed over looks, it's going to be okay. We're going we're gonna to physically move these and you're going to get a much better perception about what's tight, what doesn't like to move, and what does. Um, but the, um, the, three, the top three issues of the neck and shoulder, no command, you still need to. Oh, I just need to do Yeah. The top three shoulder problems that people run into are shoulder impingement, which is the collision between the humerus and the, the tip of the scapula. So the, the scapula is like a little kind of hand-sized uh, bone that rides up on the top of the ribcage. And when you lift your shoulder above your, or when you lift your arm above your shoulder height, the head of the humerus needs to be able to tip back. The scapula needs to be able to tip back with it so it doesn't collide. But if you're lacking mobility or, or ability to move the, the thoracic spine, if your thoracic spine is stuck, your, that scapula is also stuck. And that humerus is going to collide into it every time you reach up over shoulder height. So the tip of the humerus, when it collides with that scapula, it's going to pinch muscles of your rotator cuff. Uh, it'll, it will pinch the, the head of your bicep inside of that little gap in the, between those two bony processes. So sometimes you can feel it, there's like a direct clicking, and sometimes you can't feel it. But if you're having an impingement syndrome, what you'll notice is you physically can't move past it because it's a it's a bone on bone collision. So Bootsy has pretty decent shoulder mobility. She's gonna tuck her chin to her chest. So when, when she does that, she's rounding out this upper back and um, keeping that uh, thoracic spine from being able to extend and move with the scapula. So with that rounded upper back, now slowly raise your hand over your head. So she's got a physical endpoint to where she can no longer move her, uh, her humerus uh, above her head. And it's, it's going to be different for each of us. But people, go ahead and relax and relax. The more, the, the, the tighter you are, the less mobility, the earlier you're going to bump into that, that collision. And unless you're, you know, and, and you may not, if you have good mobility, you may be able to get your hand all the way over your head or even beyond that. Um, but it's important to know what your limitations are because if you try and exceed that, if you try to borrow mobility that you don't have from your thoracic spine, you can borrow it from your glenohumeral joint, you can extend past that range of motion, and you're just going to pinch and shear those small muscles, and you're going to create some of our second problem, which is bicep tendonitis, or torn rotator cuff, which happens all the time. It's one of the most common injuries in the gym, because people don't know what their, limit, their limitations are in their range of motion, uh, and they continue to move anyway, and damage them terribly. So, impingement, Inability to move the humerus uh, over the over shoulder height, um, tendonitis, which is just damage and inflammation to the biceps tendon at the insertion point, or sorry, at the origin, because of impingement. You can also get this from faulty loading mechanics. You can get tendonitis from uh, improper improper joint mechanics stemming from lack of mobility. So. Uh, the way that you're picking weights up and rowing and pushing and pulling 
is not efficient because the head of the humerus isn't allowed to get into a neutral position, we can properly recruit the muscles that are designed to do that. So you can get this from a physical problem or a loading problem, so a mechanical problem or a loading problem. And then the final piece, which is the one that uh, we might know the most about because we see it a lot every day, is forward head posture, which is any time, well, you can, Um, are you trying to have better posture? Or? No. <laughs> All right. So um, look that way. Look that way. Uh, so the uh, I was going to set up a plumb line, but the gym, the, the the floor in the gym is crooked, so it would really be kind of false data. But in essence, if we hung a, a, a string along the line of gravity, the string should fall just behind the the ear, right here in the center of the glenohumeral joint and it should fall in a straight line down just in front of the lateral malleolus, uh, the ankle bone. Um, but anytime someone's, uh, the back of the ear or the head is forward of the glenohumeral joint, that's technically forward head posture. So push your, the back, tuck your chin, push the back of your head into my hand, no, back here. So remember like you give yourself a double chin, nice. That's called neutral spine. So. You probably, I mean, I rarely see this, but this is, this is how our, our head's actually supposed to sit over our shoulders. Cool. I think that's all that it demonstrated in anatomy that we need right now. High five. Thank you, Betsy, oh. for being an awesome example. But forward head posture, so that's simply just this, right? From, uh, often, I mean, like, the, 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 the problem or the, um, the syndromes are symptoms and causes of other problems. Um, we'll talk about um, shortened muscles, improper recruitment, breathing dysfunctions, which we're going we're gonna to do some breathing drills today as well. Before it hit posture, there can be a lot of causes to it, but at the end of the day, it's, struct it's, a, it's structural weakness, and we're going to talk about mobility and stability in a second while we're defining our terms. Before it hit posture, before we get in too deep into the weeds, it's simply remember that head is riding far forward of the, uh, of the center line of the body. Humorous, for lack of a better reference point, right now. So the consequences of impingement syndrome are damage to the shoulder, right? The consequences of biceps, biceps tendonitis, Joe, where are they? Pain. Pain, <laughs> lots of it. Front-sided front -sided shoulder pain the most common form of pain in the athletic population. So people who exercise are the most likely to get, or the, the, the most likely injury for them to get is front-sided shoulder pain. Often, uh, biceps tendonitis. And then forward head posture, the consequence of this is a, a small amount of consistent stress and damage to the discs in your cervical spine, and uh, a, a a, a constant, I would say low grade, but even medium grade amount of stress to the muscles of the upper back and your respiratory muscles. We'll talk about that in a second, but what that means is it's harder and harder and harder to recruit the right muscles to get yourself into good posture where you can have uh, better, better breathing mechanics and you can recover from the stresses of exercise in life a lot better when your posture is good. Forward head, and you know, we all look attractive when we stand tall. So. Um, but those are, that's, for, that's what forward head posture is, and the consequences of it. Um, question. Sure. Does, does frozen shoulder have anything to do with impingement? You know, frozen shoulder is, is something that I, I find really interesting. I've had, I've, I've had a few friends who've had it, but um, it's the, the people that have been suffering from it, as, as I'm talking about it, so it comes out of nowhere, and usually... When I look at them, I see the pre I see all these uh, these tie-ins, but I wouldn't I, I don't I don't think I've read anything in the literature that actually ties those things together. I think it's something that comes on much like plantar fasciitis, which I, we kind of do know that tissue quality and um, and posture and strength have a lot to do with uh, the onset of uh, plantar fasciitis. Um, but so I'd say there I mean like. I'm, my opinion, Josh's theory. I think they're. I think they're all related, but I don't. You know, I can't say for sure. But so we've got the our syndromes defined. Uh, now we've got.
the, uh, the, the cure, or no, rather the, the fix. And as we talk about the exercises that we're going to do today, I want to explain to you the whys. Uh, the things that we are trying to adjust here in the gym are people's bodies and their, 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 their form and function, for lack of a better uh, uh, term. We're, we're trying to improve the mobility or the movement quality of, of everybody's movement pattern. And mobility is just your ability to express full range of motion. And I would add pain-free, but that's not, that's not actually in the textbook definition. Ergo, our definition of stability inside of Training for Warriors is your, the ability to keep your joints from reaching a painful position or range of motion. So what that means is, if we have good joint stability, we don't drop into forward head posture when we're doing our exercises because our thoracic spine, our scapular retractors, our posterior chain is strong enough to stabilize the, the spine while we're doing compound movements. So we want to have such good joint stability that we don't run into pain and injury while we're, while we're exercising. Um, and we'll talk about how we get that done here as we do our exercises. Uh, strength is just the ability for uh, your body to overcome an external force. And power is the application of speed to your strength. So you can do a push-up, you're overcoming the force of gravity and your body weight. And if you can do an explosive push-up and uh, uh, push yourself up off the floor, you can just you can recruit that strength really fast. That's great. Um, and so that's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, mobility, stability, strength, and power. And the movements that we're going to do today are all about mobility and stability. So it's taking a joint through a full range of motion and making that joint, allowing that joint to be stable while we're doing it. Okay. Whew. That was a lot of technical stuff. But does everybody have an idea on the areas of the body that we're talking about and what we're talking about now. So what we want to have, and the reason why I keep using the terms mobility and stability is because PTs and doctors and online and everybody's interest, I mean like if you look on like joint mobilities, 92 joint mobility uh, exercises, that's great. Uh, we want our mobile joints to be mobile and we want our stable joints to be stable and we want our mobile joints to be mobile enough but are mobile and stable enough to stop before they get us injured. So we want to create great joint mobility and stability through proper muscle tone and pro proper joint mechanics. Part of it is some muscles are tight, some muscles are weak. Part of it is the brain just needs to be educated on what a complete range of motion is or isn't. And that's where we're going to come in today. And we're going to do some movements that are going to educate the brain into those different directions so that you can feel what it feels like to move well. Everybody follow? Not follow? Ready to exercise? All right, let's get moving. 